Okay, we're back. We're live. Three o'clock rock. Welcome to Energy in America on ThinkTech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called New Issues for a New Administration. And we're going to talk about the border adjustment tax and energy alliances with Russia. Our guest for the show is Lucien Pugliarisi. Thanks for participating, Lucien, and welcome to the show. It's good to be here, Jay. So we're on a threshold of a new administration. And this new administration is in Washington, one that is already sucking the oxygen out of the prospects of good government, some say. Two issues come to mind on the energy front of this administration. One involves the larger economic implications of the border adjustment tax that Paul Ryan and the new Republican Congress are considering. Will this help our economy? Will it help our energy independence or not? The second issue we discuss is Russia a huge piece of geography with lots of natural resources, including energy resources. So what relationship does Donald Trump have with energy going forward in Russia? And what is the relationship, uh, what relationship does his choice for Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, CEO of Exxon, have with energy going forward in Russia? So many questions, such confusion, such issues of credibility, so many risks in this increasingly complex and threatening geopolitical world, and we haven't even had an inauguration yet. So our guest and regular contributor, Lucien Pugliarisi, will help us understand today. So welcome back to the show, Lou. Nice to have you here. Let okay. me ask you at first, uh, what's going on with the border adjustment tax? So I think this is the tax no one ever heard of, but it's a very big deal. And, uh, and what, what we want to, the way to start to think about this, I think, is, which is the important thing is, if you look at most of the economies of the world, uh, particularly the developed world, they have something called a value-added tax. So in Europe, it's not uncommon. You buy your chocolate croissant, and the guy adds on a 20% tax on that. Or maybe through the whole production process, the flour, they added a bit. And it's, a, it's essentially a consumption tax. And the argument goes like this. Europeans have a relatively low corporate tax rate because they shift their taxes on to consumers. Now, in the U.S., we have a relatively high corporate tax rate, 35 percent. Some people get deductions for solar power, yada, 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 all this stuff. But the basic fact is that embedded, at least the theory goes, embedded in the price of goods in the U.S. is a high corporate income tax. It's kind of embedded in this price. And so the way to fix this is to get, get the corporate rate down in the U.S., but you have to pay for this lower corporate tax rate some way. And so is there a way to impose this cost so it looks a little bit like a consumption tax and puts the U.S. on a more level playing field? So the thinking behind the border adjustment tax is that we're going to tax, we're going to put an adjustment, not really a tax, an adjustment about the corporate tax. So the corporate tax goes down to 20%. And all incoming goods in the U.S. will have a 20% tax. And all exports will have that tax removed. Mm -hmm. And so the thinking behind this well, What do you is mean removed? That, How does that work? Yeah, so the, tax with, the corporate tax rate gets lowered by 20%. Businesses would no longer need to depreciate capital investment, by the way. Instead, they will be able to fully write off or expense everything. Ah. Businesses would no longer need to pay tax to the IRS on profits from foreign operations. So That's... the idea is to go to a full territorial tax. This is a really big deal with the Republican uh, yeah. you know, caucus uh, on the House. Yeah. Businesses would no longer be able to deduct interest as a business expense, and the corporate tax would be border-adjusted, as we just discussed. Now, you can imagine... Certain folks get quite nervous about this, like Walmart and Target, who import large amounts of goods and services, and particularly goods, you know, TVs from China, whatever. And what the, the tax analysts are telling us, they're saying, well, you shouldn't worry about that. Because of the adjustment, uh, the dollar will rise sufficiently to fully compensate for the increased border adjustment tax. So we'll be broadening the tax base, but not everyone is fully on board with this uh, effort yet, as you can well imagine. Uh, some folks are quite concerned that um, it may be not compliant with the WTO or that uh, there'll be retaliation. 
Some folks may view this as a tariff and not a border adjustment. Isn't it a tariff? It's the same thing as a tariff, isn't it? Well, I think there the argument is it's not a tariff, but an adjustment tax to make sure embedded in the price of U.S. goods, right, that are consumed domestically is the 20% corporate income tax. And that this tax is not part of U.S. exports. So they're in a way trying to mimic a VAT. But it's extremely complex. I can tell you that there's a huge debate. Different companies have different views on this. And I think it's going to be, it's very important for Hawaii, by the way, when you consider how much of your goods are imported, particularly yeah. from the Pacific Rim. Yeah, and, well, uh, it's very scary well, because this is it's a regressive tax when you do this, isn't it? All consumption taxes are regressive. Yes. And yeah. in fact, you might argue that the U.S. tax system is one of the least regressive in the world because we do not have high value-added taxes on consumption yeah. taxes. Well, I mean, we have a gross excise tax, <clears throat> uh, 4%, and, and the special yeah, add-on to that is, uh, is more because of the rail here in Oahu. But um, that's a regressive tax. And what's, what's interesting about that tax, different, for example, from the New York tax, which is at a higher rate, the sales tax there, uh, New, the New York tax exempts a lot of things like food and medicine and the, you know, things that are close to the heart of the consumer. But in Hawaii, the 4% is actually generates a lot more income, uh, more for the government per capita, because it's on everything. There are no exceptions. Yeah, and yeah. so that that's and that's completely regressive, and it's uh, that the uh, the surtax I mentioned because a rail is likely to be extended in this uh, this year's legislature, so there'll be more and more regret. And then if you add this on top, this uh, border adjustment tax, you have another <clears throat> uh, consumption tax, and that'll also be regressive, and we will suffer by having you know a fairly stiff combination of yeah. consumer consumption, regressive taxes, no? So if you believe the economic theory on this, which is the dollar will adjust by the full amount of this tax, and that the dollar will rise by 20%. And this is, of course, uh, it's actually you know, Martin Feldstein wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal about this two or three days ago, and it's in theory correct. However, you could see where the dollar starts to rise and all of a sudden people think it comes under threat because the WTO or some other countries are going to retaliate. But I think for a while there's another point. If you're going to have a more expensive dollar, that's great for Hawaiians who want to travel to Asia. But think about all the tourists that come to Hawaii Absolutely. from foreign countries who now are facing a 20% higher uh, effective cost for getting hotel rooms, buying food on the islands, that this is actually a pretty interesting problem. If you're highly dependent on foreigners to buy your services, which is in Hawaii, the tourist industry. Yeah, and it so flies in the face of what Donald Trump was saying before, namely that he wanted to increase American exports to go overseas. Because if the dollar is stronger, right, it's those exports are more expensive overseas, and that diminishes the possibility of selling those exports overseas, doesn't it? Right, but he's there. The argument on this, and this is actually a plan that's been in the works uh, under uh, you know Leader Ryan, under you know the House Majority Leader and uh, uh, Ryan, who has been working on this for years. And the, part of this is a kind of the motivation of this is quite, I think, positive. The idea is how do you get a strict territorial tax? How do you quit getting, how do you change the gaming of American companies that want to show high costs in the U.S. and high profits in other countries where the tax rates are lower? So they're trying to level the playing field on this, on this issue by getting uh, to make it quite neutral. So you can bring these, no longer worry about where you do your R&D, no longer worry where you take your profits. And that if you can take more of the profits here in the U.S., you will go ahead and do so. So mm -hmm. you'll get a big revenue bump from this. So it has some positive aspects, but there might be a disparity between theory and execution. 
It hasn't been tried in this country before. And I think what's interesting is that, like so many other initiatives that now are under consideration, if you look at it in the silo all by itself, you know, it might have some appeal. But, it, yeah, but we it don't actually, know it how it affects other things. Right. And, and I can tell you in Washington, the various interest groups, the retail guys, the auto guys, they're all over the map on this thing. No one can really decide where they want to be. Uh, and this is true for the auto companies. You think about the oil companies. If you're uh, a domestic producer, this thing's pretty great. You know, you'll try to, your, the price of, uh, of oil will rise in the U.S., right? So you can, but if you're a refiner who's importing oil and then exporting it, you might not view this as so positive. Yeah, well, and if you're, you if you're Hawaii, we, we import uh, $6 billion worth of fossil fuel, um, and imports to us would be subject to the uh, import adjustment tax, right, the border adjustment tax. Yes, and so you would have to hope that the dollar adjustment makes it appear neutral. <laughs> I think you That's a hope. <laughs> that your exports, which are generally, uh, would go out of Hawaii tax-free, right? We'd go, you'd get this rebate or you'd get, you wouldn't have this tax on the exports. The interesting thing about that is a lot of your exports are consumed in Hawaii when foreigners come to buy those services, which yeah. is to stay in a hotel. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's really interesting it's when you put it that way, Lou, yeah. because, because what, you know, what happens is we have our $6 billion, so add, what, 20% on, on top of that, that'd be that much yeah. more expensive. And we do not export anything. I mean, if we had, we ever had a manufacturing sector, that's gone yeah. for decades. And so we don't have any benefit in the export side. And uh, to the extent we, are, you know, you conceptually treat us as a, an exporter of tourist services, the tax or the reduction of tax would not apply to that. So we yeah, pay on so one side of the ledger, but we don't get benefit on the other side. So if I were the Hawaiian delegation, I would be in there talking to the uh, House committees and saying, look, we understand that this is a way to rebalance the U.S. trade deficit and to uh, find a different corporate structure, but we need to have the consumption of Hawaiian tourist services by foreigners treated as an export. That would be the cutout. Yeah, no, that, then, then it would work, uh, at least according yeah, yeah. to its original <laughs> intention. Um, I think the other thing that you mentioned that I'd like to explore for a minute um, is, is the notion that foreign uh, income, uh, far American corporations would not be taxed on foreign income. Right. And, and that troubles that me. A territorial I, tax. I, it troubles me because a lot of these multinationals, Exxon, for example, you remember them, yeah. Rex Tillerson's Exxon, that Exxon, okay, has a lot of foreign income. And indeed, multinationals, which uh, you know began in the U.S., uh, are into you know, into multinational activities, and and it's been uh, for years now, many decades. It's been their modus operandi to try to push their income offshore and try to get the best tax break, but they still have to pay uh, U.S. tax in some cases. Now, this would exclude that. This would change the picture for them, and regardless of all the other you know provisions in this sweeping change of the tax code they get a huge break in not having to pay taxes at any rate for offshore income. Am I right? Right, but their offshore income is taxed now. They're worried about the... the, the, the proponents of this bill would argue that there would be a huge incentive for the U.S. to be the cost center for those taxes now because the corporate rate has gone down to 20%. Mm -hmm. So that you would want to account for as much revenue as you can in the U.S., as a better rate than overseas. Yes, this would be the theory behind it. This is one of the motivations behind this legislation. I see. Well, you know, again, it's uh, in, in a silo. Uh, that sounds pretty good, but it's untested, at least in this country or for this country and for our revenue code in general. And I, and I really wonder, maybe, you, maybe you've seen some of this, whether anybody has conducted the kind of testing, you know, the kind of mm, think tank testing on this kind of possibility so we can model what would happen to the tax structure and the economy. Yeah, so there are uh, pretty substantial efforts underway at the American Enterprise Institute. We're not really tax guys. That's a real dark art. But uh, <laughs> Dark art, we... thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I would be shocked if someone in Hawaii 
who worries about the corporate structure and the nature of the economy hasn't started to look at this. It would make a lot of sense to me. Somebody should be doing some work on it. Absolutely. Lou, that's a great idea. Thank you for that. We're going to take a short break. That's Lou Pugliarisi. He is the CEO of EPRI, which is the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, and we, we uh, join him. He joins us by Skype, and we are delighted to have him. So much so, we take a short break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii. We are here every Tuesday at 3 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii, talking to and about shrinks and mental health. Please join us. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Good afternoon. Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Bingo, we're back. Uh, we're with Lucian Vujirisi of EPRINC, the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington. He joins us by Skype, and we're talking about uh, changes in energy policy um, that, that are coming in this new um, uh, administration yet to be inaugurated. <laughs> okay, so we, we, talked, we talked briefly, um, you know, about the tax changes and how they might affect energy and especially energy in Hawaii, but let's talk about Russia. You know, I haven't thought so much about Russia in, in many years. All of a sudden, we're all thinking about Russia. We hear about Russia as much as we hear about Donald Trump. And so can we take a minute and get a little precis about where Russia has gone with energy, Lou? Yeah, so I think that uh, Russia has an enormous endowment of both uh, crude oil and natural gas reserves. And its natural gas reserves are truly enormous. And in the and it uh, during the Soviet era, right, it had a rather inefficient but uh, extensive petroleum industry. It was really built under a Cold War uh, kind of framework in which, you know, all the pipelines and all the refiners and everything were well defended and made to run the central economy. It was a real mercantilist, and anything left over was export. They really didn't think about it that way. But and th then in about the 1974-75, we had the first Arab oil embargo. The world price of oil shot up uh, quite high. People thought that was high, from three dollars to twelve dollars a barrel. At That's high. one point, it got up to as high as forty dollars a barrel. Yeah. And the U.S. and the uh, uh, European allies had enormous discussions. And one of the things we did was to encourage the uh, Europeans to get off of OPEC oil, right? to not use it for industrial activities, to not use it for uh, utilities. And the Europeans began a kind of sustained program yeah, for coal, but also to begin to import um, gas from Russia, and if you, from the Soviet Union at the time. And if you remember, you probably don't remember, but under Jimmy Carter, the Russians uh, invaded Afghanistan, and we actually withdrew uh, technology and equipment for the expansion of the Russian mm -hmm. pipeline system. But the, Rus but the Europeans over time became, I wouldn't say heavily dependent, but somewhat, and in many cases, depending which country you are in Europe, reliant on Russian gas. Yeah. The collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, uh, oil production fell dramatically. Uh, eventually, the, uh, Russia was reconstituted in a more top-down system under Vladimir Putin, and Russian production recovered, actually. Russian production, oil production today is uh, uh, 10 million barrels a day, quite large, one of the largest producers in the world, mm -hmm. and Russia provides extensive natural gas to the European Union. And the European Union has had, an ex has, has had a, since the in disruptions in the Ukraine, the European Union has had an active program to try to lessen its dependence on Russian gas. 
But you know what, what interests me is that there was a time, and, and my, my recollection is imperfect, but there was a time when Russia was um, using the supply of gas as a geopolitical weapon. And if they didn't like something that was happening, they turned it off. And then uh, Western Europe, you know, had to had come to the table. Uh, so, but lately, lately, even yeah. with uh, Ukraine, Russia hasn't done that, have they? No, and I think, look, if you think about this in terms of a, a kind of you know, bilateral high-risk scenario, if, you, if you're Russia, that's a very risky, you, know, you have this large natural gas asset. And in many cases, in many ways, the resurgence of the American uh, shale gas revolution has substantially obliterated the value of that asset. I mean, gas prices, until just very recently, you know, with a cold uh, sort of polar vortex taking place in Asia and, and Europe, have been very low, including internationally traded gas prices. And so the Europeans have also had an active program of renewables, which has resulted in them in using a lot more coal. It's a kind of funny system, you know, because the, the system isn't executed that well. And so I would say the dependence issue from the perspective of the Russians are, look, we were, the real problem was that we only had one outlet to get that gas to Europe, and that was through Ukraine. And the Ukrainians stiffed us. So we, and I think for the Russians it was a big mistake. We said, we tell them, we're telling Ukrainians, look, you can't have the gas we're giving. You have to keep pushing this gas through Europe. But your gas, you can't have that. And the Ukrainians said, fine, we're just not giving, we're not passing any of that gas to Europe. We'll just <laughs> use it. Right? Now, there's different views on what the Russians did and the Ukrainians did in this case. Yeah. And in fact, the, and as a result, the Russians have had a very active program to do two things. I mean, the Russians have tried to build pipelines outside Ukraine. So you have the Nord Stream. South Strip. So you have an active program to bypass the Ukraine. And then you have an active sort of diplomatic initiative on the part of the United States to encourage the Europeans to diversify their gas supplies, including getting access to U.S. LNG. That's good business, isn't it? It can be a good business. And I think that uh, as we discussed uh, we're going to see some major initiatives to expand LNG, particularly in the Pacific. And LNG would come largely from what, the U.S.? So I think the Gulf Coast U.S. is going to be the biggest. Lots of shipments have made it to the, uh, to the European uh, Union. From, we've only, begin to, only begun to export LNG from the U.S. in the last year. I mean, we used to have small volumes from, from Alaska, from the Kenai Peninsula many years ago. But, and just Last week, the first shipment of U.S. LNG made its way to Japan. Very interesting. So can uh, LNG from the Gulf or parts of America, uh, can that um, be at a lesser price than the gas that Russia would deliver through Gazprom so and these pipes very, across the border? Yeah, so it's very tough to beat the Russians on price because they have the built-in infrastructure and the main gas reserves feeding the European continent are pretty low cost. Mm -hmm. Now you can, so I think the U US policy of the Europeans has been, look, this dependence of Europe is very uneven. Countries like Bulgaria and some of the Baltics are highly dependent. Germany, other countries much less dependent. And what, what we should do is encourage the Europeans to have better interconnection, more storage, and a more open and competitive market. And the Europeans as well have been going after Gazprom in recent years as a kind of uh, monopolist. And so they've made them uh, uh, diversify the, some of their holdings. And, uh, well, that's, that's good. That's healthy. That uh, is good. I think if, if Europe is dependent on the Russians these days, the Russians are very, what do I say, strategic. And yeah. Europe could be sorry if they rely on them in this particular environment. Yeah, and, and it's an ongoing, and in many cases the Europeans are not undertaking the things they do need to do to be more yeah. uh, you know, uh, resilient. Let's say. Well, let, let's, move, let's move to uh, Mr. Trump. Um, so he's got Rex Tillerson. Rex Tillerson received the uh, uh, Friend of Russia Award from Mr. Putin not too mm -hmm. long ago. Uh, he's involved in, in, in fuel. 
uh, and uh, energy in Russia. He's participated in partnerships with the Russian government, um, probably in fossil fuel. I don't, I don't know about gas. Maybe you, you do. Um, but it would, it would seem to me that part of what's at stake here uh, is the relationship of Exxon and Russia and maybe uh, and Trump and, and Putin and Tillerson all together now. Uh, what, what's happening here? Are, so we, this, are uh, we involved Rex, somehow in energy in Russia? Yeah, so Rex Tillerson was actually in the chair all day today in front of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate. And uh, I think he spent at least 10 hours... I think they let him go to the bathroom about halfway through, but he was there for about 10 That's hours. That's because they like him so much. <laughs> and there was a huge discussion on sanctions. Because as you know, as the, uh, after the uh, acquisition, shall we say, of Crimea by the Russians, and then the uh, sort of incursions within uh, eastern Ukraine, that the U.S. placed a lot of energy sanctions on uh, on Russia and but those sanctions were really on future development and technology and I, the, the Exxon position actually is quite interesting in Russia it was drilling a very expensive and Arctic well which uh, Tillerson got grilled but I think his position on that was look we went into the State Department when the sanctions said look you can't, we can't pull out from this well till it's done because it's unsafe. If we left and we left it for the Russians, that, that would be very dangerous. We don't want to do that. And I think one of the interesting things about Exxon's operations in, in Russia is they're one of the few that really didn't get beat up very bad financially. Yeah. And part of that is they're pretty good at negotiating deals. So what do you think? One, one final question here before we go, and that is... Uh, uh, given this relationship uh, between Tillerson and maybe Trump, uh, depending on how how accurate those memoranda are of his involvement in Russia and what they might have on him, you think he's going to lift the sanctions or let them stay in place? No, I think actually, I don't know what is going to happen on the sanctions. We could talk about that. But Tillerson made it quite clear. And actually, I, I've met him several times. I know him. You know, he's a leader of the Boy Scouts. I think he was an Eagle Scout. He... Um, has severed his ties completely from Exxon. And as he said, uh, all the reasons for me not to take this job are selfish, right? I mean, the guy's got $400 million. He could lie on the beach. I don't think it'd be a big problem. Yeah. And so I don't think the notion that he's taking this job to enrich himself, I think that's just a bunch of hope. Okay, we're going really to have to see. That I... He, I hope we can come back to this next time, Lou. Yep. Um, this is very interesting stuff. Next time we can look back at this hearing and see how it worked out. And other other appointments. <laughs> Thank you, Lou Pudirisi, uh, the president of uh, the Energy Policy Research Foundation. Aloha. Till next time.